English is one of the most widely spoken languages in the world, but what is its origin and how different were early forms of English compared to the language we speak today? At the end of this video as well, I will discuss the foreign languages that are the easiest for English speakers to learn and the ones that are the most difficult. Now let's start by looking at what languages were spoken in England prior to the earliest form of English being spoken. Well, there were two main languages in particular spoken in the land we call England today. The first one was a Celtic language, or to be more specific, Common Brythonic, with different regions probably speaking slightly different variations of Brythonic. This was the language of the Celtic Britons of ancient England prior to the Roman invasion which began in earnest in 43 AD. Common Brythonic is an insular Celtic language and an ancient ancestor of languages such as Welsh, Cumbric, Cornish and Breton in Brittany. The ancient Pictish language was also potentially a related language to Brythonic, a sort of sister language. The Goidelic languages make up the second branch of insular Celtic languages, namely Irish, Scottish, Gaelic and Manx, with the latter spoken on the Isle of Man, but this is a story for another video. So the people of ancient England largely spoke a Celtic Brythonic language prior to the Roman invasion. After the Romans invaded, however, Latin became the main language of administration, of trade and of the military. Now this is some of the historical context, but now let's look at the real beginnings of the English language. Well, it can be traced back to around the 5th century AD when the Anglo-Saxons migrated into Britain after the Romans left in 410 AD. This migration of these Germanic peoples resulted in Old English emerging. In fact, another word for Old English is Anglo-Saxon. And the word English itself actually means pertaining to the Angles. You will sometimes see the word Ingvionic mentioned when reading about this time, also known as North Sea Germanic, which are a group of Northern West Germanic languages that consists of Old Frisian, Old English and Old Saxon, as well as their descendants, with all these languages closely related. Now before we move on to look at some examples of Old English, and it's actually really interesting to see how different Old English is to Modern English, I should quickly note that basically Old English separated into four main dialects that roughly corresponded to different Anglo-Saxon kingdoms of ancient England. The four dialects were Kentish, Mercian, Northumbrian and West Saxon. It was West Saxon that formed the basis for the literary standard of the later Old English period, although the dominant forms of Middle and Modern English would develop mainly from Mercian. Now these are some examples of Old English sayings, and as you can see, Old English is pretty much unintelligible for speakers of Modern English, or my Scottish version of Modern English, outside of certain words that you can see some similarity in, such as health or wolves. Now the oldest Old English inscriptions were written using a runic system, but from about the 8th century this was replaced by a version of the Latin alphabet. One of the finest examples of Old English literature is the epic poem Beowulf, which was written in the West Saxon dialect, perhaps around the 8th century AD, although this is debated and it could have been written a little later. It was around this time, however, that other influences had a major impact on Old English. During the Viking period, for instance, from around the 8th century to the 11th century AD, there was a significant impact of Old Norse on Old English, particularly in relation to vocabulary and place names. Place names ending in by and thorp tend to have a Viking origin, such as Darby and Scunthorpe. There are also so many words you use on a day-to-day -day basis that come from Old Norse that come from the Vikings, from egg to crawl, from husband to anger. The day of the week Thursday also comes from Old Norse, meaning Thor's day. Shortly after the Vikings, and actually a people that were connected to the Vikings through their influence on Northern France, something I went through in my previous video, it was the turn of the Normans to have their impact on the English language. With the Normans of course conquering England in the 11th century, the Normans spoke Old Norman, a variety of Old French. This became the language spoken by the ruling class, the courts and the church, and it profoundly influenced English vocabulary, especially in law, government, art, literature and religion. In fact, the word government itself comes from Old French. Male names such as William, Robert and Richard soon became common as well, which all have a French or Germanic origin. This new language of England is often referred to as Anglo-Norman, and over time Old Norman and Old English gradually merged, eventually forming what we call Middle English. One of the most notable works of Middle English was the Canterbury Tales, written by Geoffrey Chaucer. It is a collection of 24 stories written between 1387 and 1400, and it helped to standardise the London dialect of Middle English. Now this is a side-by-side -side comparison of a section of one of these stories, one in Middle English and one in Modern English. 
And as you can see, it is much more intelligible for us to understand compared to Old English. Now it was shortly after the publication of the Canterbury Tales that the English language went through a major transition known as the Great Vowel Shift. It took place gradually between around 1400 and 1700 and involved a series of changes, including changes in the pronunciation of all Middle English long vowels. Some consonant words also changed, particularly those that became silent. It was through this period of transition the Middle English evolved into Early Modern English, with the invention of the printing press in the 15th century also helping to standardise English spelling and grammar. Also during the Renaissance, there was an influx of Latin and Greek words into English, particularly in the fields of science, medicine and the arts. Works of literature around the 17th century also contributed significantly to the development and spread of English, namely the King James Bible and the works of William Shakespeare. It was around this time of these two works being published that the modern English language emerged, with Britain's imperial rule in the world helping to spread English. During this imperial phase as well, English did absorb many different words from different languages, and continued to develop, with the Industrial Revolution also contributing more words. So although English has Germanic roots, and is considered a West Germanic language thanks to the Anglo-Saxons, it has had so many influences on it down through history, from Latin to Old Norse, Old Norman to influences across the globe. There is more to the story however. Followers of this channel will know that English, as well as many other languages such as Russian, French, Irish etc, are all within the Indo-European language family. But why is this? Why do so many people speak an Indo-European language? Well, it's thought that all these languages had a single common ancestor, Proto-Indo-European. Although it's still debated, one popular theory is that this ancestral language originated in the area in modern Ukraine and parts of Russia, on the Pontic Caspian steppe around 4500 to 2500 BC. Then beginning around 5000 years ago, or 3000 BC, migrations associated with the Yamnaya culture spread this language both into Europe and Asia, with different migrations and invasions down through history also compounding this. So the true origin of the English language goes back to at least the Proto-Indo-European language and perhaps beyond, but I'm going to do a follow-up video at some point in the future where I go into more detail on this fascinating topic. Let's now turn our attention to the languages that are the easiest and most difficult for native English speakers um, to learn. Well, a really interesting insight into this comes from the US State Department. They basically categorise these different languages depending on how long it takes for them to train their diplomats and their officials for different regions around the world. With this based on 76 years of training experience, on average, although there is some variation in this, you know, prior knowledge, etc., the quickest languages to train officials to reach general professional proficiency are Category 1 languages, which take between 24 and 30 weeks, or about 600 to 750 class hours. These include Dutch, which is generally considered to be one of the easiest languages for English people to learn, Danish, Swedish and Italian, with French and Spanish taking a little longer, but still only at 30 weeks. German is a Category 2 language, which may be somewhat surprising, given that English is obviously a West Germanic language, um, at approximately 36 weeks to learn. I believe this is a bit more difficult though, because German grammar is a little more difficult to learn, with Indonesian and Malay also in this category, which is somewhat surprising. Category 3 languages, which take approximately 44 weeks to learn, include Albanian, Finnish, Greek, Russian and Turkish. As far as the hardest languages to learn, well these are Category 4 languages at approximately 88 weeks to learn. These are Arabic, Chinese Cantonese, Chinese Mandarin, Japanese and Korean. Out of interest, what languages do you speak or have you tried to learn some foreign languages? Please let me know in the comments below. As we have seen, English is a West Germanic language within the broader Indo-European language family. But what is the genetic history of Britain and Ireland? To find out, please click here. Thanks for watching, please subscribe and hit the bell, and I'll see you next time.